Rest. Can I get an amen? Planning and decision making. Building teams, creating healthy culture, and influencing others, and much, much more. So I encourage you to um, sign up for that if you're not already signed up for the amazing Mark Bible study that just keeps getting bigger and bigger thanks to Elizabeth's teaching prowess. We're so grateful to have her. Um, That's a great group. The men's group is growing. Danny, where's Danny? Danny's around. Danny's leading that. And of course, our uh, following Jesus spiritual practices, our very own pastors, Vince and Larissa, are teaching that. And of course, we have a class for the youth. So come on out, get a free meal, and enjoy fellowship, and uh, plug in and, and be discipled, right? We're called to be discipled. So, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Kevin. You call me Kev, if you would like. If, you, if you're old school, you call me Pastor Kev, but you don't have to. Um, and I'm the Director of Operations, Associate Pastor, Executive, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah. And we've recently launched a counseling ministry here at the church. It's not clinical, although I'm qualified for clinical counseling. What we're doing here is pastoral counseling. And if we, uh, in our meeting, figure out that there's a, there's a deeper need, we can refer to clinical counseling. But it's just something that we felt was really important um, here at Faith Community to offer to the, to the people here who consider faith community their home. So this is not for your brother's, sister's, aunt. This is for you. And if you'd like to just make an appointment and come on in and have a chat, you can find that information on the website. So I encourage you to do that. Um, yeah, and we're off and running with that. The last thing I want to do is dismiss our youths, the youths. So if you are a youth, um, blessings to you. Give them a hand and our... Pastors Jeremiah and Brittany, I'm going to lead them. And uh, Pastor Vince jumped the gun. I was going to introduce him. But anyway, <laughs> let's give a hand for our pastor, Pastor Vince. Good morning, church. Good morning to you. So we're uh, kicking off a new um, sermon series. We're going to be in the book of Daniel. Uh, in the book of Daniel, found in the Hebrew Scriptures, found in the Old Testament. Um, It is page 710. (laughs) If you find your way to page 710 uh, in your Bible, you will be there in the book of Daniel. Um, Why the book of Daniel? Why the book of Daniel? It's in the Bible. Um, The book of Daniel... I think presents two topics that I think that are absolutely critical for the church to wrestle with and understand better. And those two topics are, particularly in in the context of chaos, when life is disordered, when life is disappointing, when uh, there's not a really cut and dry, um, obvious way of how to arrive in the world because you live in kind of these competing realities. Um, you have multiple commitments. Um, what does it look like for God to be sovereign? What does it look like for, for God to move and act and, and to see his purposes take place in the world when life is chaotic, disappointing, frustrating, confusing? And then the other one is, what what does fidelity look like? What does allegiance look like? What does faithfulness look like to God when we live in these places that, again, a lot of times we have competing, maybe commitments. Um, Maybe just as you think about the workplace, as you think about arriving in the workplace, and it's like, what does faithfulness to God look like in my vocation? Um, And so I think Daniel just presents this this place of, of just understanding, like, how do we arrive in the world? How do we live in the world, right? Because that, that common reflection is, is that, that we, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. And Daniel presents that to us, and I think in really profound and wise ways. I want to talk about that first one for, for a little bit, and I'll talk about the second one, and then we'll spend some time in chapter one. The first one is that the context of the book of Daniel is that this is a book that is steeped in challenges and lament for the people of God. It's a difficult time for the people of God. 
one of the, the commentators on the book of Daniel, if you go to the next slide, uh, describes the context in which the da book of Daniel is written um, in this way. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon, who has just conquered Judah, which is the southern part of Israel, Nebuchadnezzar spared nothing and nobody. He besieged Jerusalem, and after 18 months of great suffering, starvation, and disease, his army broke through the walls in 587 B.C. and poured into the city, slaughtering as they went. They looted the temple, then burnt it. They destroyed and burnt the city of David, reducing it to rubble and ashes. And then they dragged a lar large proportion of the people off into exile, including King Zedekiah. Only the poorest people were allowed to remain in the land, including Jeremiah. And in, and in the end, even they fled to Egypt. It was the most, it's not hyperbole, it was the most traumatic event in the whole Old Testament history. And the awful horror of it is memorialized in the sobbing poetry of Lamentations. Is there hope? Is there hope? What does it look like for God to be sovereign amidst the most devastating time in Israel's history. And for you, for you Bible students, for you fellow Bible nerds, what you will notice about the descriptions of, of where Israel's taken back to, the reason I use the words taken back to, is when they're pulled from Jerusalem, from Israel, to, to where Babylon is located, you might notice that this is the very land that Abraham was called to leave when God called him. And so the context is, what does it look like when you're back at zero? What, is it, what, is, what does God's sovereignty look like when life is backwards, not forward? Is God still sovereign? Is he still at work? Is he still active in the world around us? Babylon seems stronger than God, and the kingdom of God feels really far away. And we've been there. So what does it look like for the kingdom of God to feel distant? For to, to navigate our day-to-day -day life in which we say, is there hope? Can things, can life arise from here? But what you will also notice in that context, and it gives you a little bit of, of, of an introduction to the fact that God is sovereign amidst that chaos, is the simple uh, name, Daniel. His name means God is judge. God is judge. And what you will discover over the course of this book is that you will find that nations will be weighed and they will be found wanting. And it starts off with Israel. Israel is given over by the hand of God into exile. God is sovereign. He's the one that's moving behind the scenes. And what you'll see in this is that there will be multiple nations that will rise and will fall. But God will remain. God is judge. God is sovereign. God is at work. God is active in the world around us. And in particular, you'll see this in the way that, that chapter 1 introduces us to this theme, because what you'll see in chapter 1, verse 1, it says that King Nebuchadnezzar besieged Judah. So King Nebuchadnezzar's in charge, he takes over, he, he conquers God's people, but then when you'll notice in, in chapter 1, verse 21, the very end of the chapter, it says, and Daniel remained in the palace until when? Until the reign of King Cyrus. That's like two, three empires later. And it's this, and it's this way of just showing that, 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 that nations will exercise these blips of power on the grand human history scene, but God's people remain. But God's people remain. 
It's this powerful way that the author of Daniel is showing us King Nebuchadnezzar may be in power for a moment, but God's people remain. Babylon may be in power for a moment, but God's people remain. The Medes and Persians may be in power for a moment, but God's people will remain. Rome may be in power for a moment, but God's people will remain. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Ancient of Days. He's the one that rules and reigns over the arc of human history. And there will be times when evil, dark empires will reign, but God's in the middle of it, and he's working. The other topic that we'll play with throughout this um, throughout this book is, is our fidelity. What does allegiance to God look like? Particularly when we live in these competing realities. And, and it's highlighted by the fact that, that Daniel is, is, is gonna, you're going to see him living in two kingdoms. Right? You're going to see him, the fact that Daniel is, he, he's, he's a faithful follower of God, but he's also a powerful official in an enemy empire. What do you do when you live in those competing realities? And, and, and you'll see this constant, Daniel is all about blended realities. And it's even, it's even shown in the fact that when, if you were to read the book in its original language, what you would find is you'd be reading along chapter 1, chapter 2, you'd get into about verse 4 of, of chapter 2, and then you would find that, that for some reason the language that it's written in will switch from Hebrew to Aramaic. And then as you're reading along and you're reading along through chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and you turn the page to chapter 8, suddenly you find that it switches for some reason from Aramaic back to Hebrew. And you see again this just blended reality that's at play. The other thing that you'll notice about this book is that it's split perfectly in half where the first six chapters are history. They're telling the history of the people of Israel, of Israel and them being brought into exile. And then there's this shift that happens in chapter 7 where suddenly the book changes its literary style. And now suddenly you're reading through apocalyptic prophecy. And it's showing blended reality. There's, it starts with the reign of the Babylonians. It goes to the reigns of the Persians. Daniel has two names. It's just constantly showing the fact that we, that, that we live in this gray area so often in life. And, and the church has to wrestle with that and ask, you know, what does it look like for me to be faithful in those spaces that we exist in? A simple example, a simple example. Every Monday night, I play basketball with a group of guys. I'm competitive. And I live in this, this tension. I live in this tension of everyone that shows up on Monday night, none of, the, none of the guys that show up there, it's about 8 to 14 guys that show up, none of them are a part of, of our community. I don't, know, I don't know of any of them that, that are members of other church communities, and they know that I'm, my wife and I are the pastors of this church, they know that I'm the one that's opening the doors and inviting them onto a church campus. And so here, here I am, like in the space of someone just hit a three-pointer over me, and I really want to take that personal. <laughs> and I want revenge. <laughs> right? And... But, but I'm Pastor Vince. <laughs> and even if, even if it wasn't the title. Follower of Jesus. And, and you live in that, you, you know what it is to live in those places of tension. Like, I, I really want to win tonight. <laughs> and I want to let them know that I won. And, and I want to properly embody the image of God in this world. 
Well, what does fidelity look like in these places of tension? What, is, what does fidelity look like in these, in these spaces in which we just, where we live in these blended realities? C.J. Wright, who I quoted from earlier, also goes on to reflect on, on the commentary that he writes on the book of Daniel. He, he, he just wrestles with the fact that, listen, Israel, I mean, these four men were, were raised up in, in the courts of Israel. They, they were, were told in chapter 1, which we'll read in a little bit here, they, they were raised up to, to be nobles and officials for Jerusalem. That's what their training ground was. These, these are four young men who were apprentices in the palace of Jerusalem. Their context as they were being raised was, what is the benefit, what does it look like for the flourishing of Israel? And now because they're a conquered people and they're pulled away from their home and dropped into the land of Babylon, and now they're suddenly in a different training ground. They're being raised up to be officials for the Babylonians. And now they have to, they, they now wear a different title. They, they now live in this place of saying, we're, we're meant to consider the thriving of an enemy empire. We're, we're meant to consider what the good of Babylon looks like. And they're, they're, they're consulted. They're, they're, they're asked, like, what do you, how, do you, how do you see things? They're interpreting visions and dreams on behalf of the king of Babylon so that things would go well for him. And so, again, they live in this, this, they live in this tension. Like, do, do we, like, do we sabotage them? <laughs> Do, do, we, do we make sure that things don't go well for Babylon? And, and, it's, and it's chaotic. It's not cut and dry. It's not black and white. It's, it's blended realities. And this makes life complicated. What, how do we arrive as faithful followers of Jesus when so often we live in these overlapping places of reality? Right? Where, where there, there's going to be gray areas. And you're going to find, especially here in chapter 1, you're going to find that there are going to be areas in which Daniel and his friends say yes to Babylon that might even make us scratch our head, that we may want to judge them. Why are you saying yes to that? And that we may scratch our head on the things that they say no to, the things that they say, no, we're not going to do that. And, and as faithful followers of Jesus, right, it, hopefully it's the space in which we navigate and we ask questions of ourselves like this. What does it look like to be an employee and be a faithful follower of Jesus? What, is it, what does it look like to engage with our bosses and our coworkers in a way that images God? What does it look like to be a citizen an empire. What does it look like to arrive here in our own nation and to live in America but not be of America? What does it look like to be a student? What does it look like to be in, in classes and in universities? What does it look like to study things that even are going to be contradictory to the ways of God? How do we sit in those spaces? How do we navigate those areas? What does it look like to be friend? What does it look like to have relentless welcome to the people around us, to be warm, to be engaging, to, 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 to embody the fruit of the Spirit, to be loving, right, patient, kind, good, gracious? Like, what does it look like to arrive amongst our friends, particularly our friends who don't know Jesus? be inviting, to be fun, to be welcoming? What does it look like to host the people around us well? What does it look like to pursue the good of our city? What does it look like to advocate for social change? What does it look like to advocate for things to be different in the world around us? But to do that as a faithful follower of Jesus. So how do we live in this world with fidelity to God, but also care about the, the world around us? There's, there's tension there. 
how do we arrive in those realities? And in this book, in this book, beyond those two things, hopefully the er other areas that we'll be able to engage with will be areas like integrity and er areas like wisdom, prayer, compassion, hope. It's a really beautiful book. And let's start with chapter one. Would you stand with me as we read Daniel chapter one, page 710? It'll be on the screen as well. It says this. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and per permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. That the king ordered Ash... Uh, Phanez, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are all well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. J Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid that the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other men, young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light, in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided by, for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual apt aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the king of Cyrus. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray that you, you, would, be, you would continue to be our source of wisdom. You would be our firm foundation. As we live in this world, as we navigate the different places uh, that you set us in. Lord, may we look to you to, to be our comfort and to be our guide. Would we know you in more profound ways? Would you grow our affection for you? And that we might be a blessing to the world around us. And so we say that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please feel free to have a seat. So here's the scene. Here's the scene. These four young men, along with others, are taken from the palace of Jerusalem, 
and they're placed into the courts of Babylon. And what you will find is four things. You'll find four things. One, these four young men are given a pagan education that would compete with their understanding of God. They are given political positions of power to care for an enemy empire. They are given new names, and those names honor false gods. And they're given royal food and wine. Friends, if you were to ask me which of those four on the list they would say yes to, I, I would probably, without reading the story, I would probably say, yeah, they'd probably be okay with eating the food. Right? Like, they'd, they'd, they'd probably be fine with saying, yeah, like, we could, we could sit at the table and, and eat the food here. And the things that I would imagine that they would say no to would be the other three things. <laughs> I'd imagine that they would say, like, no, we can't. We can't study about your gods. We can't be indoctrinated and assimilated into your ways. I'd imagine, like, they may say, hey, we, we can't advise the king in continuing to conquer the nations around us, including our own people. I imagine the, the, the one that, for the most, like, the most for me that they would say, like, no to would be, do you want to change my name from the Lord is my helper, Yahweh is my helper, and you want to change my name to servant of the god Nebo? But they say yes. And it's, it's confounding. They say yes to the, to the first three things, and then they say no to the food. And what's particularly interesting about that is that these are four young men. <laughs> Have you ever tried to feed a 15 to 20-year-old? <laughs> Food is high on the priority list. And not only that, like, like what, we just, what we read earlier from, from um, commentator Wright was, was that they were besieged for months. And for months, for months they were going hungry. It was starvation. It was disease. It was disaster that was, that, was, that was encompassing the city of Jerusalem. And now they're brought over to Babylon. And you would imagine that sitting at the, Lord's ta uh, at the king's table would be, like, would be like provision from God. To going from a place of starvation to now sitting at a banquet, you would think, oh, God provides for us. There, there must have been. There must have been something about this food. That that's where they would say, mm, "That's the line." Well, that would defile me. But let's reflect a little bit. Let's reflect on a little bit on the things that they say yes to. Because, because look at what, what Daniel does in in the Hebrew Scriptures, along with with Jeremiah is it gives us an understanding of what it looks like to be exiles in the world. And one of the things that, that Daniel and the book of Jeremiah teach us that I think that later on Paul, the apostle Paul and the apostle Peter will pick up on is this, is as though, though you don't belong to the world, you're to seek the good of the city. You're to be a blessing. You're to be a blessing to the world around you. And what you find in, in Daniel is that they care for the Babylonians. And actually the posture that they arrive in to the Babylonians and to the different kings that they will serve, there's honor, there's respect, there's affection, there is care for, for a conquering king. And so what you see is them, them, 
them arriving in a place where they actually care about the thriving of Babylon. You're exiles in this world. You don't belong to this world, but you do seek to understand, to honor, and bless the world that you live in. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were good to go along with learning Babylon's culture and education. They sat in Babylonian universities, and not only did they sit in these universities, they got really good grades. <laughs> they studied well. They thrived. They had, by God's grace and by God's hand, they were given ability to, to, to grasp and understand and comprehend beyond their peers. They stepped into positions of political power and influence, which would mean saying yes to Babylon's thriving. And they even went along with being called names that meant servant of Nebo instead of being called Yahweh is my helper. And I think in that one particularly, is maybe that they understood Maybe they understood. It will be other people's tongues that will be confessing that. But my heart will remain unchanged. And they were okay with, with, with getting along with the culture around them. They were okay befriending the culture around them. But then we're introduced to an ongoing conflict that will happen throughout the rest of this book. Why food? Why say no to the food? Friends, I don't know. I don't know why. Re read, through the, read through the commentaries, you'll, you'll find a lot of different reasons. You'll, you'll find commentators will say, and maybe, maybe it was because of, of the, the Hebrew dietary laws. Maybe it was because that they understood that they would be eating this pagan food and the food wouldn't be kosher, so they would violate themselves by eating this food. But what's interesting about that is wine's not, well, I mean, excuse me, wine is something that, that would be kosher. They would be allowed that wine. So why abstain from the wine? And later on, Daniel chapter 10, you can go look it up, Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, you will find Daniel explicitly say that at some point he fasted from choice meat and wine for three weeks. And then he goes back and eats it. So is it? Is it because of kosher laws? I, maybe. Is it, commentators ask, is it because this, the food that they would be eating, that maybe the meat was sacrificed and dedicated to false gods? Maybe, maybe that's why they, they would do that. But then other commentators ask, but if that's the case, wouldn't the vegetables be dedicated as well? And then again, in Daniel chapter 10, he's eating the meat now. What's going on there? Maybe, maybe it was a way of saying, my provision doesn't come from the king. But the vegetables were provided by the king. And so you, you read through it, and, and you, you wrestle with the commentaries, and you wrestle with people who are observing about this passage, and you wrestle with the rest of the book. And, and honestly, the place that I find myself in is, I don't know why. I don't know why they said no to the food. They were willing to say yes to pagan education. They were willing to say yes to political influence in an enemy empire, they were willing to say yes to being given names that honored false gods. But they said no to the food. 
And all that I can say to you is they discerned something about this moment that they would say, no, that would defile us. And, and, and what, I, what I feel confident in being able to say to you is this. They said no to Babylon. And when you read from the commentator of, of the chief of staff, was this could cost people their heads, but they were still willing to say no to Babylon. And I think the, the lesson for us in that place is We may have places in which we belong. There are places that we serve in, and there's places that we show honor to. There are places that we have affinity towards. There are places that we have affection for. There, there are groups, that, again, that we belong to. But we retain the ability to say no, because our allegiance doesn't lie with you. You don't have our allegiance. God does. And as followers of God, what we learn from the book of Daniel is God alone has our ultimate allegiance. And we're willing to say no to Babylon. We, we're, we're willing to say nope. And it may cost us. It may cost us our very lives. But we serve God and God alone. He's the one that we belong to. I remember going to an assembly um, for my son's school. He's in first, second grade at the time. And they all stood for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> And as the Pledge of Allegiance is, is happening, I just see him mouth shut during the entire thing. And after assembly, I went up to him and asked, like, I noticed that you didn't say the Pledge of Allegiance. Why didn't you do that? And, and as a two-year-old, like, second-grade mind, excuse me, he's sitting there and he says, Something along the lines of, like, my allegiance belongs to God. Right? Like, there's this, and that, the, the point isn't, hey, you're not ever allowed to go into a place and say the Pledge of Allegiance. That's not, no, the point is, the point is, is that, that there are these times where the Holy Spirit prompts our heart. and says, there's a line here, and you need to pay attention to it. Your, your, your integrity matters here in this moment. There's times where the Holy Spirit prompts our heart and just says, mm, others may go along with that, but for you, that'll defile you. You've got to pay attention to that. I want you to take notice of that. Because, because what's unique about this place, right? Like why the food is, is if they would have went along with and, and ate this food, no one, no one would have blinked an eye at it. No, no one would have questioned whether or not they served Yahweh. It's likely that everyone would have just, just kept on going. The, the mess hall full of young men, just loud, rambunctious, right? Whatever, it would have just, it would have just went on as normal. And there's these places in which the Holy Spirit prompts our heart and just says, I, I'm just asking you to say no here. And it may not make sense. You may not have the exact reason why. But I want you to follow me. I want you to trust me in this space. Dumb, dumb little example, right? Like yesterday, I'm sitting at, at Rubio's and then I ordered a medium iced tea instead of a large cup for iced tea, and I'm sitting, and I'm working, and I'm studying, and I'm getting refills, and as it's time to leave, I was thinking, you know what I'm going to go do? I'm going to go get my, 
my tumbler from my car because it's bigger and I'm going to go come back in and I'm going to fill that up with iced tea. And I just, like, especially studying this, it just kind of felt this prompt. It was just like, oh, I don't feel good about that. <laughs> and so I, I just, it felt awkward, but I just, I, you know, I went up to the employee and I just said, hey, would you mind if I took my iced tea and I put it in my tumbler? And they just looked at me like, what? Yeah, of course you could go ahead and fill your tumbler with the iced tea here. But there's just some times where these kind of insignificant places in which the Holy Spirit prompts our heart and says, I want you, I want you to obey me here. And, and no one else may take notice. I want you to obey me here. And I think this little no for, for them, later on, they're going to have more power. Later on, they're going to have more influence. Later on, these four young men are going to have more to lose. But here in this space, this little no and listening to the prompting of God will set them up for later. When, when music's being played and people are bowing down to, to statues and fiery furnaces are what's ahead of them and dens of lions are what, 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 what stands before them, this little no sets them up well for future no's. And it matters in the small little hidden spaces that we pay attention to when the Holy Spirit says, I want you to say no here. But also what, what I want you to notice is this. Even when they said no, it was gracious and it was compassionate. They came, Daniel goes up to the, to the chief official and he says, hey, we're not going to eat that food, but let me come up with some alternative options for you. Let me give you some different ways that we might be able to approach this. And it, was, and it was reasonable. Daniel went and he said, he said no, but then he also said, but let's work this out together. And one of the commentators I came across looks at this scene and says it this way. Daniel did not throw a religious hissy fit, blowing off about Babylon's heavy-handedness and insensitivity. He simply looked around for the next possible step to take to see where that might land him. Daniel was not one of those people who believe that firmness of principle always involves acting stubborn and pig-headed. It's, it's, it's as if Daniel is fully aware that he is under the Lord's grace. Church, to take a stand in the world does not mean we need to be jerks. To image God in this world we, we, we do so with grace and love and compassion so often right the church takes this like oppositional defiant like belligerent stance to the world And we just need to remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The people around you who don't follow Jesus, they are not your enemies. They're not your enemies. And we arrive in this world with an understanding that says, I want to like the people that Jesus died for. I want to love the people around me. And there will be times where I just say, I can't go along with that. There will be times where I, in whatever it may look like, whatever place you might find yourself in, that you just know, I've got, I, I, I'm not going to go along with that. I'm not going to do that. I'm a set-apart person. But you can do so with a posture that is filled with grace and compassion and understanding. Let's wrap up with this thought. You'll notice this back and forth that takes place. And you'll see the action of Babylon, and then you'll see it immediately followed up by these, these words, God gave. And, and you'll see it in, in verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon besieged Jerusalem. And then right after that, in verse 2, 
the Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah. In verse 7, the chief of staff renamed these four young men. God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. And then in verse 16, you will see the attendant fed them only vegetables. And then in verse 17, you will, say, you will see God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude, and God gave Daniel the special ability. And it's, and it's this not-so-subtle way that the author of Daniel is showing us the world can throw at us all that it wants. The world can treat us whatever way it would like. But God gives. And what you see throughout this book, right, is you will see these four young men live in hostile, chaotic environments where there will be decrees that are, that are published for the land. There will be, there will be these, these laws that they're called to follow. There will be these areas in which, which uh, there's these oppositional forces working against them, but you will see God give. In our own lives, what we will find is this, is that there will sometimes, there's a jealous coworker, God give. There will be an unhinged, unhealthy, volatile authority figure, God gave. There will be unemployment, God gave. There will be disappointment, there will be death, there will be disease, God gave. It's this understanding of, of saying you live in this world, though it might be separate from God, he will still provide. God will still give. And my encouragement to you is just is simply this. Take your neighbor's Bible, highlight, underline, circle that phrase, God gave. God gave. Because there will be times when you're in difficult territory. There will be times where you're navigating confusing and chaotic times. God is faithful to give. God is faithful to arrive. He's the one that's at work in this world. Greater is he who is at work within us than he who's at work in the world around us. And as we look at the Lord's table, right, what, are, what, what does Jesus tell us? This is my body given for you. The table is this, this, this constant, tangible, right, understanding for us. So we recognize whatever place you find yourself in. You may be in a great season. You may be in a challenging moment in your life. Hopefully what the table is for you this morning is this, this place where you can reflect on the, on the fact God gives. You are not left to your own strength or ability. You're not left to figuring out just how to perfectly arrive in this world. The truth is, is there, there's, a, there's a chance here that, that Daniel and his friends made some wrong choices. There, there's, there's, there's a possibility that the things that they said yes to, they should have said no to. There's a possibility that the things that they said no to, God might have been like saying, yeah, you can actually go ahead and enjoy that. There, have been time, there, there could be times where they got it wrong, and there are times where they got it right. But that's not the point. The point isn't their ability. The point isn't their understanding. The point isn't their strength. It wasn't them that saw them through Babylon. It was God. God saw them through. He was their strength. He was their ability. He's the one that caused them to flourish. He's the one that gave them apt ability and understanding. He's the one that made them successful in the workplace. He's the one that gave them influence in, a th in an enemy, enemy empire. He's the one that sustains us in this world. God gives. 
God gives. And we have God in the flesh coming to us at the table and saying this. This is my body. And I give it to you. I'm with you. You have me. I'm broken. So you can be made whole. My blood's good. So that you can be forgiven. I give. I give so you can make it through today. I'm your daily bread. I'm what you need. And whatever else you're looking at in your life and saying, I need this to get by. I need this to make it through the day. Whatever you're looking at, that you would be reminded this morning, no, it's the Lord who gives. He's the one that I need. He's the one that sustains me. He's the one that causes me to be able to lift my head. He's my deliverer. He's my strength. He's my hope. He's my peace in the chaos. He makes a way through. Because of him. Friends, you're going to get it wrong. There are going to be times where I'm on that basketball court, and I'm going to go too far. But God is faithful. He will give favor. He will offer forgiveness. There are going to be times in the workplace. You're going to make a boneheaded decision. You're going to make some offhanded comment to a coworker. And you're going to be wrecked with guilt. There are going to be times when you're raising your children and you will say something that you just see immediately devastating them. You're going to feel terrible about it. There will be times that you're going to get too competitive in an office. There are going to be times that you say something to your spouse that right when it comes out of your mouth, you wish you'd take it back. times you're going to be looking over your bank statements. And you're going to be trying to figure out, I don't know how I make it through the month of May. It's not up to your ability. It's not up to your strength. It's not up to your power. God gave. God gave invite Pastor Brittany to come forward and uh, Jim if you come forward as well as we come to the Lord's table would you again reflect on the words of Jesus this is my body given for you this is my blood spilled for the forgiveness of your sins and friends the posture that you take is this you simply receive what the Lord has already given.